Tossing Grenades at Windmills Podcast. Welcome to the Tossing Grenades at Windmills Podcast. I'm Tom Rex, and this is a new series I'm doing called During the Cooling. For my hardcore listeners who are familiar with a series I did last year called After the Cooling, and it was inspired by the importance of the 2020 election. And to save you two hours of listening, it basically outlines my experience as an amateur historian and futurist and ardent reader of the news and political analysis of basically exactly what to expect after a coup. And I divided it into four sections, survival, resistance for those that choose to go that route, organizing, and rebuilding because very few people think about what it would be like in this country to try and rebuild uh, after a coup. And bottom line, uh, the message I gave to people was um, Humpty Dumpty uh, cannot be put back together again very easily, and so you should go out and vote. And um, they did, and great. Trump lost, and yet at the same time, so many people clearly didn't vote, and so many people voted for crazy town that we have a 50-50 Senate. And we have a president who is clearly much better than Trump, and who is... In my opinion, um, while a very good man and taking some bold action, basically a caretaker president, he's not Obama. Um, he, he is keeping the lights on and trying to return us to normal. And to be fair, he is dealing with a lot of very complicated things. COVID and the economy and an intractable proto-fascist, no, I'm sorry, fascist opposition. And yet at the same time, his attorney general, Garland, aside from being his frequent speaker at the Federalist Society, um, seems to be taking a lackadaisical approach to enforcing um, the 14th Amendment and sedition laws and a number of things that very, very obvious violations of federal law and the Constitution itself. Um, and basically is doing nothing. And, you know, we have all kinds of hints and whispers of indictments and investigations and, you know, but we don't see anything. You know, the, 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 the what we mainly see is some prosecution of a couple of hundred psycho protesters that took part in the January 6th um, protest, and that's it. So if I spent two hours leveraging my expertise of history and current events and um, human nature, explaining what a coup would actually be like to live through in this country, um, or at least after the fact, why am I bothering again? Well, there's two reasons, right? The first one is, um, I think that I am actually uniquely qualified compared to most Americans. Not all Americans. There are definitely Americans far more qualified than me. But not all of them do podcasts. And I have my podcast, and I can. So I will. I've lived through a coup. So for those of you not familiar, which is probably most of you, um, I used to be a Mormon missionary. and I'm going on close to 50 years old, and I was a Mormon missionary from the age of 18 to 21 on a two-year mission in Venezuela. And in Venezuela, um, both right before I left to Venezuela, and while I was there, there was a brief three-day coup attempt that was thwarted, but I was in the country when civil order broke down and have experienced firsthand what an actual coup d'etat is like. 
And so I felt that both my experience and, again, my understanding of the news and history, I mean, let's put it this way. If you're some rando listening to this for the first time, you know, feel free to stop listening. If you like my podcast and appreciate my um, my insights, then um, I feel that I can add value to helping you understand what it's going to be like when a coup happens. And I say when, not if, because at the current cruising speed, if, and there's a lot of ifs, if the Biden Justice Department does not take a much more aggressive stance against Trump. If the majority leader of the Senate does not lean on cinema and mansion very heavily to get real, meaningful voting reform passed. And if Biden does not take voting reform more seriously than infrastructure, then what you're going to have is the prettiest 3.5, I'm sorry, at this point it might be one, one, one to two trillion dollar worth of roads and bridges, cutting edge, well-built, American labor created bridges and roads and railways that will provide the perfect stream for Republican tanks to come and mow us all down and put us all in camps. Because the basic principle of government and civilization itself starts with security and power. And I am the most ardent supporter of democracy you will ever find. But I also understand civilization and government 101. And that is a government that does not support, have pow the power to maintain itself will very rapidly cease to be a government, right? If you're a tiny country without the ability to defend yourself with either a military or somebody else larger shielding you or weapons of mass destruction, you will very quickly cease to be a country because a larger country will gobble you up, right? And if you're a regime, whether it is a democratically elected one or a dictatorship, right, and you do not maintain the levers of power, which includes law enforcement and sufficient intelligence and sufficient support from the populace to prevent uh, a DeSantis or a Trump or somebody else from taking power, then you will very quickly cease to be a government. And it's more important, all the more, for a democracy to maintain sufficient fluidity and security of the voting process and voting apparatus to allow legitimate and meaningful elections, or you will very quickly cease to be a democracy. And you don't have to take my word for this. I guarantee you that there is example upon example all around the world right now of countries that used to be democracies and have ceased to be. Right. Sometimes in usually less developed democracies, it just it's just a flat out military coup, and the, the somebody in the military, usually the head of the military, decides, you know what? I think this democracy thing isn't working, so I'm going to take over, and um, I'm going to, uh, t you know, I'm going to be in charge, and I, you know, I don't even need to go through the mach machinery of how they do that. Um, there is a wonderful series on Netflix called um, How to Be a Dictator. See it, and it's pretty clear of what you need to do to take over a country, and you can take it over another dictatorship, or you can take over a democracy, and there is a formula that they have followed time and time again. But what they don't go into too much in that series is how a democracy in particular falls, and the bottom line is that it's failure to maintain the integrity of the vote, right? If you allow people to call into question the results of an election, if you don't have mo allow international monitoring of an election, if you allow fake news and social media to eat away at your civil society, 
then you were basically just asking, begging, some crazy lunatic to come along and take it away, right? And, uh, you know, all of this builds up to what I want to share with you today. But again, before I do, I, I want to, you need to understand where I'm coming from, right? So before I go into my experience in Venezuela and how I think a coup is going to roll out in this country, I want to give you just a little bit more of my background. So the thing you have to understand about the Mormon church is like all monotheistic religions, it's apocalyptic. And what does that word mean? It means that every monotheistic religion, every one of them, believes that, that the, the Messiah is returning, right? It, 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 um, Judaism, Islam, or Christianity all believe that their Messiah is coming and will set the world aright and put God's kingdom in charge, and God will do what God is going to do, and that different, you know, who the Messiah is, and when it's supposed to be, and how it's going to be after varies by religion, and even within the religion, there's probably as many interpretations as there are members of that religion. But the one thing they all have in common is every monotheistic religion, by the way, Zoroastrianism does as well, and it's a monotheistic religion, all of them believe that there will be an apocalypse. And that in that apocalypse, God will come again and will set things right. No matter the most peaceful, pacifistic, monotheistic religion you can think of, right? Quakers who don't go to war in this country. Even they believe that Christ will come again. Every single one of them believes that God at some point is going to come back. And Mormons are particularly apocalyptic. And what I mean by that is built into the DNA of the Mormon church. And if you want to go into a whole lot of details about that, I did an entirely other series, separate series in the podcast called Eight Questions That Should Be Asked of the LDS Church. And I'm not going to rehash all that, but I am going to highlight it so that you understand where I'm coming from, right? I was raised in a religion that believes that Jesus is coming again. And it believes that Jesus is coming again very soon. And I think I can think of no way, better way to summarize that than to say that the name of the Mormon church is, which by the way, they don't like you want you to call it that anymore, is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, right? Well, the latter day is literally built into the DNA of the LDS church. They believe that God could come again today or tomorrow or next week. Now, if you truly read LDS scriptures, you've got about a minimum of a three or four year window with certain blatantly obvious signs, including two prophets in Jerusalem. And lots of Christians believe that. The thing about the LDS church that is unique is that in addition to literally having the word latter day in their name, they also believe in, for example, um, a, that you should have a one year food supply. And this has been around for a hundred years. There's no secret about this. In fact, many LDS church members believe that there is a protocol in the federal government that if there's a disaster of sufficient magnitude, that church food stores will be seized to help feed and help people. And they, and some actually believe that this is a good thing because it will enhance the power and prestige of the LDS church. Because you know, if there's a famine that's sufficiently bad and the church is able to come in and save people, then they can make things better. And I go into great detail in the episode in the eight question series called, it takes a lot of men to make a gun. And it is an interesting question when you have a church that believes in being very political uh, with a guy like Mitt Romney, who in my opinion believes that he's, you know, sent by God to, to save the world, um, you know, how tempting it might be for somebody to kind of help the apocalypse along. Um, subconsciously or consciously. Either way, in my case, you have to understand that I was raised, and because I was an ardent believer, I was raised to believe that Jesus is coming again at any time, and that at some point, pick a point, things are going to start to get worse and worse and worse and worse, right? And here I am, a missionary in Venezuela, um, and I was a fanatic. I was not evil, or coral, but I was a fanatic, and I believed in the religion. Uh, I've always believed in the religion of my church when I was Mormon. Um, but you know, when I was a missionary, I, I was particularly fervent in my belief. And here you have a situation where 
society is breaking down. Now, something else you need to understand that's kind of unique to Mormons. Lots of religions have been persecuted, but very few in the United States of America have been actively um, persecuted by the actual state. There's an infamous Mormon uh, extermination decree that the governor of Missouri literally said exterminate every Mormon in the state of Missouri in uh, the early part of the 19th century. The Mormons were typically persecuted as they went from uh, New York to Ohio to Indiana and eventually to Salt Lake. And they literally had to leave the boundaries of the United States at that time to be able to actively um, pursue their religion. And members of the LDS Church never forget this. And my family has ties that go back generations. So here I am in uh, 1993 in the city of, um, I believe, I'm trying to remember, I think it was Okamari. Uh, but it was definitely near Caracas, about an hour out of Caracas. And um, I was, you know, fairly skilled as a missionary. I had a number of baptisms and a number of discussions, and my, my, my um, program was going pretty well. And all of a sudden, you, you know, you start talking to people, and there's rumors in the news about the, that the military is going to take over, right? So that's the first thing you have to understand when it happens in this country, is there will be all kinds of rumors on the internet, on Facebook, just like there are now about, you know, that there, a civil war is coming. But it's going to, you're going to start to see it less on uh, Twitter and more on, you know, CNN, where, you know, an undisclosed source today indicated that senior members of the, the uh, national military are having severe reservations about the direction that this country is going, right? You know, you, you, there are very few true secrets in this country. Uh, that are not very specifically and mechanically kept very well. I know Q, Anon, and the right wing love to believe in tons and tons of conspiracies, but with the exception of things of secret and top secret security clearance or actual conspiracies by people like Eric Prince and Blackwater or the Trump cabal, there are very few actual conspiracies, and part of that is our society from the bottom up is designed to be transparent. And, um, you know, our news media may be flawed, but it loves dirt, right? So if people, and people love to leak. And so, you know, there may be, and I, almost assuredly, there are actual blueprints and plans for people like Steve Bannon and Donald Trump and the Proud Boys and the Federalist Society and uh, the family, they have actual factual plans of you know how they're gonna hire, uh, I don't know, uh, Eric Prince in Blackwater to take over blue red states. Apparently from some of my family members, there's some things where Steve Bannon just pretty much flat out spells out how they're gonna do it. Um, and they're openly calling for it, right? So it's, it's there's no secret about the fact that a lot of people on the right think it's time for a civil war and think it's time for uh, a change of regime. So you're going to hear about it. That's the first thing you're going to hear. But even when it happens, right, it was, I, re I don't remember everything about that day, and I should go back to my journal and look because I kept a journal every day as a missionary and I could outline the, the things that I wrote there. But I think the primary reason I didn't is because I filtered a lot of what I said there because as a member of the church, you know, just like in the Book of Mormon musical, you learn to, quote, turn it off, in quote, like a light switch, right? You know, if you have feelings and thoughts that are contradictory to the teachings of the LDS church, you do your best not to think them, especially when you're a fanatic and you literally control your thoughts. So to be honest, I don't necessarily trust things that I wrote in my journal at the time, I trust my memory is a heck of a lot more. And what I remember in particular is that it was a normal day. 
it was it was a you know even though we'd been hearing rumors for a couple of weeks uh obviously as a missionary i didn't read the news because you're not supposed to do that but we talk to people when you're out every day in the streets and you're knocking doors and you have other people that you make friends with as you try and convert to the gospel or other members where you eat lunch and there were just rumors you know there'd been rumors for a couple of months and it just kept increasing and increasing and increasing but you know i got up that day i went i i did the things that missionaries do in the morning which is read scriptures and get a little exercise and fix breakfast and got dressed and went out the door with my companion and i'm sorry i don't remember which companion i had at the time and we we we're out in the streets and um then we're in somebody's house and on television apparently there are tanks in the streets right the capital the military uh is out and has and and took caracas and word spread very quickly and so we were told, you know, we, we had actually had some instructions from the mission office that if something like this did happen, you know, we need to go back to our apartment and um, sit it up, right? And very likely in events like this, um, the missionaries would be removed. In fact, at one point in Venezuela later, all the Mormon United States missionaries were removed. But that was, a, that was later. That was not while I was there. And um, so that's what we did. We, we obeyed our instructions. And once we heard um, via, I don't remember if we were in a stranger's house or a member's house, but I do remember distinctly uh, going back to our apartment and the, the crowds in the streets were frankly kind of scary. Um, it's difficult to explain a situation like that, but I think the best way I can describe it is listless right um if you've ever been in a in a riot i think the in this country the closest we could ever have anybody compare is being in los angeles during the rodney king riots but even then you knew that the united states military was going to come in and fix that situation in this situation you don't know what's going to happen right because the military is fighting itself it's fighting the country the very country you know it's the a low level burgeoning civil war and it's indefinite right you don't know what's going to happen there's because it's a small country right it, there's it, it's not like you know nato or the united states is going to sweep in and you know stop the the people trying to take over the country and you don't know when it's going to end and you don't know what's going to happen and neither do, does anybody else and while it ended up being three days you have no idea if this is the end of the Venezuelan government. Heck, you know, when you're when you're a, a Mormon missionary, for all you know, this is the beginning of the apocalypse, right? So on the one hand, being a fanatic and being religiously inclined, I was um I believed that I was gonna be protected no matter what. And as an American, I knew that my government would go to ridiculous lengths to protect me, because then they did more then than they do now. Our State Department has kind of fallen apart, thanks to Trump and a few other people. Um, but the fact of the matter is that, you know, I wasn't scared. I was a little scared. I was more scared for the people that I knew in Venezuela. But uh, the crowd did scare me, right? Uh, I'm, I, 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 I think COVID has helped you anybody at this point live through an event where the world turns upside down and we've all we've all experienced that at this point and we all have that in common and you know if you have ever been in a in a rush for christmas right a store or a mall or a toy store on christmas eve when people are trying to get that toy and they're desperate right and there's a lot of them if you've ever been in a situation with a lot of people acting kind of crazy or a mob, you know it can be scary, right? The difference is that in this case, it was everywhere, right? It wasn't like the mall or the store. It was a country. And you don't know who you can trust, and you don't know anyone, and all these people are in the streets, 
And while there wasn't rioting and there wasn't, you know, people breaking into stores and burning tires, they were just all out and all confused and all looking at each other and kind of wandering around and trying to get from point A to point B or find somebody or find their kids or get home or, you know, leave work or be at work and protect their store. Or, you know, there were just a lot of things going on. And again, I, you know, if there was violence and, 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 and chaos, I didn't experience most of it because after that initial experience in the streets, I went to the apartment and did what I was supposed to do and waited, right? And it was about two days, which was weird unto itself because for those of you who aren't familiar with the regimen of Mormon missionaries, you get one half day off and then you work 16 hour days, um, seven days a week. And so to be sitting around the apartment, having no idea what's going on, having no internet, having no, um, newspaper having no television, no radio, right? There, you're just waiting for a phone call saying, "Should you leave or not?" And and so, in my case, that part of my experience was unique compared to the other people in Venezuela. But what you need to understand about how a coup is actually going to roll out in this country is that when it happens, it's not going to be immediately clear, right? Um, Despite the fact that we all live in a fishbowl, and despite the fact that we have Twitter and Facebook and YouTube, and the revolution will be televised, right? You don't know how much it's going to be or how fast it's going to be. Let me give you an example, right? The coup plotters could be small, they could be a, a, a really poorly crappy attempt, just like the 1 6. Uh, riot was. And we know now that it was actually a coup attempt. It was a really crappy, stupid one. But it was an attempt to start chaos. And we now know, based on the reports of Trump and what was going on, both from tell all books and actual congressional investigations and everything else, we know Trump was flat out planning a coup. He wanted to stay in power, and the only thing that stopped him were two or three or maybe ten people with consciences and ethics and being at the right place in the right time. And by the way, if he ever gets in charge again, that will not happen, right? All of the people in the positions to stop this from happening will be removed within weeks if a Republican takes office. Make no mistake about it. If a Republican president, with the Republican Party being the way it is now, ever takes the presidency again, this isn't going to be a coup. It's going to be a self-coup, right? The military and the, the right-wing paramilitaries will take over. Now, there's a lot of ways this could go down, and I'm not going to go into all that, right? What I will say is that it can be small, where it's another 1-6 riot, but in this case, nobody will stop it and it might get bigger and bigger and bigger, or somebody maybe somebody will stop it. I don't know. I mean, I know the D.C. police and the Capitol police are very, very unlikely to allow that to happen again, but, you know, if there's a larger crowd or a more violent crowd or a more prepared or armed crowd and the right people are put in place over the National Guard or the Pentagon and told, you will not respond, right? then that riot might take place and our legislatures might be, you know, our legislators might be dragged out into the streets and torn limb from limb on national television, but that, that's not going to be the end of the coup now, is it, right? Because most coups do a couple of things when they happen, right? The first thing that happens in a generic coup is that the people who plot it go for three things, right? They go for critical infrastructure power, Right, that's going to be the police stations, the military outposts, armories, um, weapons of mass destruction. Those are going to be secured, um, as well as uh, city halls, uh, Congress, the White House, the Supreme Court. All leaders will be either secured 
or, or put under house arrest or, or locked up or they're already part of the coup, right? That's the first thing, the it, power, right? The second thing that's going to be secured is going to be critical infrastructure, uh, power plants, um, uh, water, uh, internet junctions, um, ISP providers. Uh, the third thing that's going to be secured, and the one that's the most visible, are uh, methods of mass communication. Right before the internet, that you know, when a coup happened, um, and still does, uh, the, one of the very first things that they take place, usually all of them at the same time, to to to, to act before the normal defense apparatus can respond, is they take um, the uh, the news, you know, the the local television stations. In this case, it, depending on the size and the scope of it, they're going to take national. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll take over CNN headquarters, they'll take over NBC headquarters in New York, they'll take over the corporate headquarters of the media organization, and that will also include social media. Uh, that means that in Silicon Valley, um, there will be tanks in the streets going to Google and Facebook and Twitter and Amazon and Apple and Microsoft and anybody that has a platform um, that can organize resistance will be a target for these people. Now, the United States is very big, and there are a lot of platforms, so they'll probably just start with the Internet, right? They're going to start by um, controlling the backbone of the Internet, and that might actually control that for the world, because people don't remember that America controls the backbone of the Internet. And so, you know, depending on the size and the organization of this, it could be, you know, in every red state, all of a sudden you see the National Guard is called out and newspapers are controlled. And in blue states, you know, um, it, 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 there's initial resistance at the federal level and they call out the National Guard to prevent right wing paramilitaries. There's, there, it could be that um, they wait two, two or three months and uh, tear out the officer corps root and branch for anybody that's not known to be a complete loyalist to Trump. Um, there's a lot of ways, like I said, it could be something they do literally on January 20th and they start with the riot and then it just kind of happens in spits and spurts and, you know, okay, CNN has gone here and now it's, um, and, and, and now uh, MSNBC is gone and, and you know it, it could be it could be piecemeal. It could be well organized and massive, right? So uh, it, it, there's and and in theory there will be a response. But as I mentioned in in after the coup, um, in this country, basically there won't be a civil war. There's just not right. There might be some small scale action between right wing paramilitaries and and um, lawful police departments or lawful National Guard, uh, there will definitely be terrorism of right-wing paramilitaries and Proud Boys and impromptu uh, Trump MAGA hats doing what, like what they did with that bus where they harassed the campaign bus for miles at a time. Um, you know, there might be in American blue cities, um, Trump supporters driving around in something called technicals, which is what the ta Taliban have, which is like a pickup truck or a squad of pickup trucks with infantry mounted machine guns and guys with rifles driving around shooting anybody that, you know, is the, you know, anybody trying to organize a protest, anybody who is the wrong skin color, anybody who looks too liberal, anybody they don't like in general, right? If, if, if there's enough chaos going on, um, then the police won't be able to respond to it. And God knows um, that a lot of the police are already on their side. So what you're going to see in a coup is chaos. And the rules that you have grown used to every single day of civilization, you know, if your house is on fire, the police, you know, the fire department shows up. Well, if your house is on fire during a coup, the fire department may show up and they may not. They may be dead. They may be under arrest. They may be part of the coup. 
uh, there's a lot of firemen who are very, 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 very um, right wing. Not all of them, but like New York just had a big scandal, big scandal with blatantly racist um, stuff. And it's not the only one that has problems like that. So the point is that um, it's going to be bad. And we don't want it to happen. So if you have the ability to write your congressman and ask them to pass voting reform, you should. Because if this happens, we might stop it, and we might not. But even if we do, you don't want to be in it. Trust me when I say that, having lived through one, you do not want to be in a coup in this country. And um, you, you just don't. You don't want to be in. You don't want this to happen, and it needs to happen, and it needs to be stopped. And if a Republican ever becomes president again, it will happen. It will happen, make no mistake about it. This has been the Tossing Grenades at Windmills podcast. Buy my book, Have Name Will Travel, at Amazon and other markets. RedAnvilCreative.com contains all our podcasts. Copyright 2021. To fight the forces of evil!